All right, welcome back. I'm Robert Breaker, and uh, we are continuing here in the book of Acts, chapter 15. And last time, uh, well, I had a wonderful time last time explaining about Christ and the shed blood and how salvation is just trusting in what Jesus did. We looked at the message of Paul. Uh, some of what we had up last week I left. Some of it I erased. I changed a little bit, so you'll have to reread some of this. But if you remember, last week we saw what happened. We see the book of Acts as a transitional book. There's things taking place and things changing. And all this different stuff taking place. But Acts chapter 13, something big happens. All of a sudden, Paul starts preaching this right here. And this is a little bit different than what he preached or the other apostles preached. And this caused a stir. And this caused some questions to arise because there were Jews who, who were back here that might have been believers. Uh, we're going to see that some of them today were not believers. Some might have been, but uh, many of them were not. And uh, they were lost. And this is a question of salvation. So this is a salvation issue. This is very important. This is a salvation issue in Acts 15. And the question is, works? Do works save you, keeping the law? Or are you saved by faith and works? And the answer is you're saved by faith. Saved by faith alone. I'm going to use the word alone because I don't see anything else, but you're saved by faith in what Jesus did. Yes, you're saved by grace through faith. So you're saved by faith. Grace, I'm going to, I'll, I'll put by grace through faith, okay? Because it's all about grace. But when you're talking about the message of grace, it's always saved by faith. That's God's grace. Not making us have to do something to get saved. By His grace, we're saved by simply trusting in what He's already done for us. And last time we read verse 1 all the way down to verse 11 and 12. So today we might start in verse 14, but I'll probably back up a little bit. And, uh, and we'll read it again from the beginning. I'll comment on, on some of the verses that we've already read already. So beginning of the verse 1. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. Telling people you must keep the law, you must do works to be saved. So the law, and to this day people say, Well, the law wasn't works. And I, I just, okay, look, you, you can believe that if you want. I clearly see that the Old Testament law, there was a lot of stuff you had to do to be saved. And to me, something that you do is a work. Now, what was it God said? Don't do this, don't do that, don't do this. All right. If you did it, how did you receive forgiveness of sins? You had to bring a sacrifice and shed its blood. So your forgiveness was based upon the blood. But you had to do it. And to me, that's a work, you doing that sacrifice. Because you had to hold its head, you had to cut the throat. Now, there was a priest that caught the, the blood and everything, but you had to do the sacrifice. You had to kill it. So I see works in the Old Testament. Some people say, oh, we'll see. okay, help yourself, amen? But today, salvation is by faith alone in the blood of Christ, not by the works. And what we're reading here in Acts chapter 15 is there were some people in the time of Paul and the apostles that were trying to say, no, it is of the works of the law. And you have to do these works. And the first work they said you had to do was you had to be circumcised. Now, I didn't get into what that means, but I'll tell you what, thank God that's not what saves us today. Men have, oh, let me just say this, and this is, a, this is an outrageous statement in the world we live today, even though it's an absolute truth, because we live in a world of craziness where they're trying to do away with mothers and fathers and men and women, and, and they're trying to uh, just brainwash people into believing things that aren't true. We live in a gender-fluid world, which is crazy, whatever that means. But men and women are different, okay? Oh, my God, we have to take you off YouTube. You just... No, it's true. Men have a certain thing between their legs that women don't. And what circumcision is, is taking that man part, to be as vague as I can, and cutting it. And there's a certain way that you cut that, and that's called circumcision. Now, can you imagine, all right? This puts a new level on what we're studying here. These people come to Paul and Barnabas and say, yeah, you might have gotten those guys saved and they might have received the Holy Spirit, but we've got to take their pants down and cut their manhood or they can't be saved. Imagine if you were a Gentile 
during this time? You would have looked at it and went, what? You mean, no, I, I trusted in God who died for me and shed his blood. I'm trusting in Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. I trust in what he did for me. And now you're telling me that I'm not saved and the way I get saved is pull my pants down and let you cut part of me off? <laughs> that doesn't sound very good. <laughs> Yet that's exactly what's going on here. So this is why I tell you the difference between the who and the what for salvation. All in the old part of the book of Acts, before we get up to this point, all the early apostles were all about who Jesus is. They were already talking only to people who were circumcised. So circumcision was not an issue until we get to this part of the Bible. Because you were either circumcised or you weren't. Now some people come and say, no, but you've got to be circumcised in order to be saved, or you can't be saved. That's what it's saying. After the manner of Moses, or you cannot be saved. Verse 1. So thank God salvation isn't dependent on what part of our bodies we cut. That's horrible. Thank God it's not. Matter of fact, Paul tells us in Colossians there's a spiritual circumcision, that when we get saved, we are circumcised, spiritually, not physically. Now verse 2. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. So they went up to Jerusalem about the question. I told you last time that the question to me is twofold. Does a man get saved by circumcision? What they do. And does a man stay saved after he's circumcised by keeping the law? Because what if he gets circumcised, then he says, no, nah, I'm not going to keep the law anymore. Okay, does he lose it? So I see a twofold question there. So they go up to Jerusalem, verse 3, and being brought on their way by the church, they pass through Phoenice and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles, and they cause great joy unto all the brethren. Now, isn't that funny what it says? That it declares the conversion. <laughs> They're already converted. They're already saved without the circumcision. So no wonder Paul and Barnabas were disputing with those men. Because they saw these guys get saved. They saw these Gentiles get the Holy Spirit, as well as Jews. They're like, no, they're saved. Who are you to say, no, they're not saved. They've got to go get circumcised to be saved. Okay, now verse 5. Actually, verse 4. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. So this is one time, first of all, before the meeting, they declare all this. So this is when Paul would have told them all about this message that he preached that brought up this whole question. And then again they talk. Verse 12. Then all the multitude kept on gave audience to Paul and Barnabas declaring what miracles. So twice Paul and Barnabas got to speak and to say, now this is how it is. This is what God showed us. Okay, That salvation is by faith, not by works. It's not by the law of Moses. It's by faith. So then in verse um, 5. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed, saying. So they were believers, but believing in what? I think they might have possibly believed who Jesus was, but they didn't accept this message of trusting in what Jesus did. So were they saved? That's, that's the question. Maybe they were believers only in their head, but not in their heart. And that's a possibility too. So they were believers in the sense they believed with their head, but they didn't from their heart trust in Jesus. And who were they? They were Pharisees. They were priests. The law gave the priest their office. Paul's going around telling people we're no longer under the law. So these priests are going, well, then I don't have a job. How am I going to eat? So they're trying to take Christianity and force it back under the Old Testament so they can keep their job. And they don't care about the fact that that can damn souls to hell. And we'll see here a little bit later, there's a verse that talks about subverting the soul. This teaching that they're trying to bring up, that you have to be circumcised, is a damnable heresy. And we'll see that a little bit later too in the book of Jude. So we're continuing here in verse 5, saying, these Pharisees believed, saying, that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them that they keep the law of Moses. So, circumcised to get saved, keep the law to stay saved. That's why I say the thing, the thing in question here was a two-part thing. Verse 6, And the apostles and elders came together for to consider of this matter. So they come together to consider this. So here's all the apostles together in one place with other Christians, both Jew and Gentile. And if you were a Gentile and you'd gotten saved, you probably wanted to hear this. Because you're like, what if they all say I do have to be circumcised? You mean I'm going to have to go in and drop my britches and let them cut me up? I don't know if I want to do that. So you would have been anxious if you were a Gentile. What do they say? 
And at the end of this, you'd be like, shoo, we don't have to be circumcised. Because that's what the outcome of this meeting is, is no, you're not circumcised. You're not under the law. You're under grace. So, <clears throat> verse 7. Well, did I read verse 6? Verse 6, and the apostles and elders came together for to consider this matter. Yes, I did. Verse 7. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God among, uh, made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So even Peter is saying it's by belief. So where would he have understood that, that salvation is by belief? Well, he saw that when they believed, they received. And then Paul is preaching that you're justified by faith, by believing. I had somebody email me the other day and say, faith and belief are two different things. They're not the same thing. And they were very adamant about it and, 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 and angry. And I said, okay, uh, Webster's 1828 Dictionary, I look up faith, it says belief. I look up belief, it says faith. And I go, well, okay, whatever. You can believe whatever you want to believe. But to me, you're saved by faith, according to Paul, you're saved by believing. Believing in faith. I said, it's even the same word in Greek. And, oh, you're running to the Greek. No, but you're trying to make two separate words into two completely different... I still don't understand where they're coming from or what they're trying to say. But to me, faith and belief are synonyms. We're saved by faith. The Bible says many times in many verses that it says we're saved by belief or by believing in many verses. I don't see two separate things. There's not two separate salvations. There's one salvation by grace through faith, by believing the gospel, believing in the blood of Christ, trusting the blood. All right, so here we have uh, verse 9. Oh, actually, verse... Verse 7, where he says they should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Now, verse 9, And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. So they got the Holy Spirit. Gentiles get saved by believing. They receive the Holy Spirit by faith. That is in accordance to Paul's preaching, too. So if you go to Ephesians 1.13, what does Paul say? He says, when you believe the gospel, you get the Holy Spirit. So you get the Holy Spirit by... And guess what? Believing. Huh. There's used interchangeably, belief and faith. So you receive the Holy Spirit when you believe, according to Paul, when you believe the gospel. Believe about the blood atonement of Christ, the death, burial, resurrection, and all that. So here we continue here, and he says that they got the Holy Spirit. Well, if you got the Holy Spirit, then you're saved. Who are you to come along and tell somebody that has the Holy Spirit, well, you still need to be circumcised or you're not saved. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense. So Peter is standing up saying, look, he says they got the Holy Ghost even as we, even as he did unto us, verse 8. Verse 9, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by what? By faith. Now therefore, why tempt ye God? And put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. I love this, what Peter is saying. Peter confesses that even the Jews couldn't keep the law. They were in bondage to it. They were slaves to the law. He says, even we could not keep the law. Now, what are you doing trying to tell the Gentiles that they got to go back under something that we couldn't even keep? What does Paul say about the law? You know, I still hear people today say, but Brother Breaker, we're still under the law. <laughs> really? Have you read your Bible? Galatians chapter 3, verse 10. For as many as are under the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed in everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law. The law is a curse. You want to go down to the curse? Well, the Bible says that Jesus Christ died to redeem us from the curse of the law. Look at what it says there in verse 13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. How do we get salvation? Well, verse 11. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. So you're not justified by the law. You're justified by faith. Well, that's Paul's message. Yeah. And even Peter is in agreement. Yeah, you get the Holy Spirit by faith. You get saved, you get justified. Verse 12, and the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Look at Galatians 3.21. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise of faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. 23, but before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should be afterwards be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. For you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. So, we're saved by what? Acts chapter 15 is asking a question. 
Are you saved by keeping the law, or are you justified, saved by faith? There's only two ways. It's either this one or that one. So which is it? Is it works, or is it faith alone? Acts chapter 15 says it's by faith. So if anyone is trying to say that salvation is by works or by getting under the law, they're wrong. We're not saved by works. We're saved by faith. So back to Acts chapter 15. It's so sad that there are people out there that say, oh, but you're saved by works or faith and works. No, you're saved by faith. You're justified by faith. So back to Acts chapter 15. Peter says in verse 11, But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved even as they. So Peter, the first uh, one to speak up in the early book of Acts, the first one going out and preaching, says, No, it's by grace. You're saved by grace. Now what does it mean when he's talking about salvation by grace, salvation by grace? Well, clearly he's talking about salvation by grace through faith. Ephesians uh, 2, 8, 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So the grace gospel is the gospel of salvation by faith alone, without works. And that's what the Bible clearly teaches. Now, uh, Ephesians 1, 13 again, When you believe the gospel, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So you get the Holy Spirit by faith, not by circumcision, not by keeping the law, no longer by water baptism. It's when you believe the gospel by faith, you receive the Holy Spirit, and you're sealed till the day of redemption. So Peter receives the grace message from Paul. And he says, I'm looking at Paul's side, and I'm looking at the side of these guys. And he says, you know, Paul is right. No longer are we under the law. We're under grace. We're saved by grace through faith. We're saved by belief. Now verse 12. Then all the multitude kept silent and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul. Okay, so Barnabas and Paul speak again. Now verse 4, what does it say? When they were coming to Jerusalem, they were received in the church of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. So they speak one time about all this, the thing that brought this whole question up. And then they get to speak again. And this time they talk about what? Declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. Because there were Jews there that were like, you sure the Gentiles can get saved? And the Jews seek after a sign. So, yeah, we did all these signs. Okay, well, if you saw signs, I'm a Jew. I don't believe without signs. So I guess, yeah, I guess Gentiles can get saved. So verse 13, And after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Now, James speaks up here. Now, this is where we stopped last time. We stopped at verse 12. Now we're going to start today in verse 13. And look what he says here. And after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Now, this is James, the Lord's brother. He speaks up and he gives his judgment. It sounds like he is the leader of the early church. Look at what he says in verse 19. This is still speaking, James. And he says, Wherefore my sentence is that we trouble not them, which, for, which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. So this guy, James, he says, Okay, here's my sentence. Now, a guy that passes sentence on something is the guy in charge. Now, you go to the Church of Rome. I don't know what else to call it, but what they call it, the Holy Mother Church, they call it. The Roman Catholic Church says the first pope is Peter. Well, here we see the entire church together in the first Christian council, the Council of Jerusalem. And Peter is not in charge. The one who's speaking up and closing this and, and giving the sentence and saying, well, this is how it's going to be, was James. Now, I don't believe in popes. The word pope is not in the Bible. But clearly, as you read the book of Acts, you do not see Peter in charge. The man who's in charge of this meeting, the man who's the first, if you want to use the word pope, and I won't, I don't like that word, but the man who's the first bishop of Jerusalem was not Peter. It's James. It's right there in the context. So here's what he says. He gives his sentence. What is that? His, he's saying, okay, we've talked about it, we've discussed it, I'm in charge here. So James says, this is how it is. And that settled the matter. So it's James, not Peter. I don't understand how a person can be a Roman Catholic. It must be that they just don't read the Scriptures. Because if you read the Bible, you can't be a Roman Catholic. You cannot find Peter as the first Pope. And you cannot find what the Roman Catholic Church teaches today, which is salvation by works. Here you clearly see Peter saying, it's by grace. It's by faith. And yet, in the 1500s, there was a church split in the Catholic Church, and Martin Luther comes out, and Martin Luther says, I've read Paul, I've read the Bible, I believe we're justified by faith without works. And the Catholic Church says, oh, heretic, heretic. And he's like, what? I just believe the Bible. 
So it's amazing to me how a person can be a Catholic. They're trusting in their works or in their religion or in their baptism or in their confession or in the Mass. or in some, They're trusting in something other than the blood of Christ. And that's sad. Please listen to Peter. Please listen to Paul. Please listen to James. Please accept what the Scripture says. We're not justified by works. We're justified by faith. Now, here in verse 13, And then after they held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Now this is James, the Lord's brother. The other James, remember Peter, James, and John, that James was killed in Acts chapter 12 by Herod. So there were two James. And so the first James was killed, which was the brother of, of John. This is James the Lord's brother, and we see that in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 19. Paul is telling about his time here, and he says he saw James the Lord's brother. So this is the brother of Jesus Christ. Now it would stand to reason, if he was Jesus' literal half-brother, step-brother, or however you want to say it, that he would be the head of the church, because he was the closest to Jesus of all of them, I guess, because he would have grown up with Jesus. I'm sure Jesus would have taught him a lot of stuff, so imagine the early church. They didn't vote Peter as the head. They voted James, the brother of Jesus Christ. He answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Verse 14, Simeon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. Now, Simeon is Peter. Again, and I've said this before in other verse-by-verse -verse teachings, and some people, I guess, got it, some haven't, but Peter has three names. He's called Peter, he's called Cephas, and he's called Simon. Matter of fact, sometimes Jesus calls him Simon Peter. So Simeon, or Simon, is Peter. And so James is standing up and says, Okay, Simon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles. When did he say that? Well, we just read it. Verse 7. How Peter stood up and says, Remember how God by my mouth uh, made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe? So James is reiterating everything that took place there in their speech. And he's saying now, Simon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a name for his people. Okay? And then he says here, verse 15, And to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written. Now what comes next? I am still scratching my head trying to figure out. All through the book of Acts, we clearly see that the apostles knew their Old Testament scriptures. I'm not going to go back to all the chapters we've been to before, but there's often times that they're talking about who Jesus is, and they're quoting Psalms. They're, they're quoting Old Testament passages. They're saying, that's a prophecy of Jesus, and that was Jesus, and that was Jesus. And they're telling you that in the Old Testament, you can clearly find Jesus Christ. That's why the Bible says that the Old Testament law was the schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. If you read the Old Testament, you can't help but see it speaks of Jesus, and that you can't be saved by the law. You must come to the future one who's coming, and trust him because he's the only one that can save you. And that's what the law speaks of, is Jesus Christ. Now, watch what he says in verse 15. And to this agree the words of the prophet as it is written. And then he quotes in verse 16 from Amos chapter 9. And again, there are things in the Bible that I will teach, and I'll teach dogmatically when I know for sure they say this or that or the other thing. There are other things in the Bible that I read and I just go, I'm still scratching my head going, okay, I have no idea why you said that. This is one of the passages that I've kind of filed in the back of my brain that when I get to heaven, it's going to be one of the things that I say, now Jesus, would you explain this to me? <laughs> because I do not understand what I'm about to read to you. Here's what he quotes from an Old Testament prophet, and this comes from Amos chapter 9 and verse 11. And before I read it, before I read it, let me tell you when this is taking place. Acts chapter 15 takes place in about 45 A.D. All right? Acts chapter 15, it's around 45 A.D. that this is taking place. Actually, some people say it's chapter 51 A.D. So here's what I'll do. I'll put it like this. It's somewhere between 45 to 51 A.D., okay? Sometimes it's hard for me to pinpoint exactly. My Bible note says it's 51 A.D. So somewhere in this time, around 50 A.D. or something like that, this is taking place. Now, we can figure out exactly the date by going to Paul and adding up from Christ and when he got saved and the 14 years later and all that. So I, I didn't do that. I'm sorry, but it's somewhere in this time period of 45 to 51 A.D. more or less. What he's doing here is he's about to talk about the rebuilding of the temple. Now, I don't get this because, look, 70 A.D. is when the temple is destroyed. 
So, what we're about to read, he says, now in the Old Testament talks about when God rebuilds the temple of Israel. <laughs> Why would he say that if the temple hasn't even been destroyed yet? I don't get it. So there must be some sort of a double, like, like oftentimes there is, some sort of a double meaning. Could it be the temple is his body? Because Jesus talked about his body being a temple. Um, so could it be referring to that? Here's what we're going to do. We're going to read it, and then I'm going to take you to Amos, and I'm going to show you what Amos chapter 9 is about. It's all about future events, and it's pretty amazing. Acts chapter 15, verse 16. Here's the quote from Amos 9, 11. After this, I will return and build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up. <laughs> really? It's still standing until 70 AD. So why is he quoting a scripture about the rebuilding of the temple if it's still right there? I don't get it. I don't get it. Maybe Luke wrote this years later after the temple had been destroyed. I don't know. And he remembered that. Maybe he's talking about the tabernacle of, of the body of Christ and, and, and Jesus' body. He was killed. Now he rose again. He came back. I don't know. But I want to take you to Amos chapter 9. Here's what I do know. The Bible is written by God. Every man that penned down the words of the Bible were under the influence of the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, let me say it correctly. They, the Holy Spirit spoke through them. So they weren't just talking and saying their own words. The Holy Spirit of God was speaking through them. So when this guy James speaks up and says what he says, it's the Holy Spirit of God speaking. So God the Holy Spirit is speaking through this fellow. Now watch what it says here in Amos chapter 9. Actually, let me read verse 11. This is what he's quoting from, Amos 9, 11. In that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen and close up the breaches thereof, and I will raise up his ruins, and I will build it as in the days of old. All right, remember, he's the tabernacle's still there. It hasn't been destroyed yet. So did they know it's going to be destroyed? Did God reveal unto James and the other apostles, because Israel had rejected their Messiah, that that was going to be destroyed? And so did they understand that at that time? I don't. I have no idea. Or is he thinking of the tabernacle as the body of Christ? And he's saying, okay, we know that Jesus is going to return in his glorified body. I, what is he saying here? It's weird, is it not? Now let's read the context of Amos chapter 9, and let's begin there in verse 9. Amos 9.9, 9, For lo, I will command, and I will sift the house of Israel among all nations, like as corn is sifted into a sieve. Yet shall not the least grain fall upon the earth. All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword, which say the evil shall not overtake nor prevent us. All right, what happened? After we read the entire book of Acts, you know what we understand? That because the Jews reject their Messiah, God says, okay, I'm going to the Gentiles. And we know in 70 AD the temple was destroyed and all the Jews were cast out of Israel and there was no place for them in Israel anymore and they were dispersed among the nations just like the prophecy says will take place. And there are a lot of prophecies like that in the Old Testament about how the Jews will be dispersed among the nations, but then come back and get their land back. And then it says the tabernacle will be what? Rebuilt. Now, that's verse 11. Now verse 12. That they may possess the remnant of Edom, and of all the heathen which are called by my name, saith the Lord that doeth this. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper, and the treader of grapes him that sow a seed, and the mountains shall drop sweet wine, and all the hills shall melt. And I will bring again the captivity of my people of Israel, and they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and drink the wine thereof, and they shall also make gardens and eat of the fruit of them. And I will plant them on, upon their land, and they shall be no more pulled up out of their land, which I have given them, saith the Lord thy God. We have a prophecy in the book of Amos of someday God's going to kick out of Israel the Jews and someday he's going to bring them right back. And here, 20 years before it even happens, he starts to quote a verse about how it's going to happen and then it's going to be rebuilt in the future. I don't understand how any man, there's a famous YouTube preacher, I'm not going to say this fellow's name, who says God is done with the Jews and God is finished with the Jews. There are no Jews today. God will never have the Jews come back to their land or rebuild it or anything like that. And he makes documentaries about how there's no more Jews. I don't understand how any man could say such a foolish and ignorant statement. The Bible says that God will disperse the Jews among the nations 
But in the last day, he will bring them back out of captivity. And he says, and he will raise up the tabernacle that was in ruins and build it as in days of old. So clearly the Bible teaches a rebuilt temple in Israel. And the Jews coming back. And guess what? In 1947, they went back. The United Nations said, this is your land. They voted and said, you can have it. 1948, they founded themselves their own government. And here we are in 2018. I can't believe the Lord hasn't come back yet. But they've just celebrated 70 years as a nation. And as I speak, just the other day in the news, I heard that the Jews in Israel are inviting 70 nations together and say, we're ready to rebuild our temple in Jerusalem. Come watch us dedicate the temple. And I'm sitting here looking at my watch going, uh, rapture, Lord, rapture now, <laughs> anytime. Now, I don't know if they're going to rebuild it. I know they have that desire to. They want to dedicate it and they want to build it. But boy, I'm looking at that and I'm saying, man, the Lord must be coming back soon. Soon, soon, soon. So you explain that to me. If you know, send me an email. I don't understand how James could go to that verse and start quoting a verse about tribulation. Is James thinking that, all right, yay, Gentiles are getting saved. Now Jesus is coming back very shortly. Do they understand that the church age is 2,000 years? Are they still looking for the fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week of prophecy? Is that what they're thinking? Is that... Yay, Gentiles are getting saved, but God's going to come back to Israel real soon. I don't know. Are they expecting the Daniel 70th week, the, um, the Jacob's trouble right then? Is that why he quotes that verse? I don't know. This is one of those passages of scriptures that I just go, bur, 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 bur. I don't know why he quoted that. But I'm glad he did because it takes us back to an Old Testament passage that shows us that God's not done with the Jews and once that temple is destroyed and put to ruins, someday he's going to rebuild it. And the Jews, even though they're dispersed throughout the world, they will come back. And that's exactly what happens. And we see that after the rapture, and I probably don't have enough room to put this up here, then in the tribulation, that's when all this is rebuilt and everything. And then in the millennial kingdom, for a thousand years, why? They rule with Jesus, as do we who are saved in our, in our glorified bodies, and those Jews will be in their natural bodies. All right, now verse 17. Verse 17 says, That the residue of men might seek after the Lord, and all the Gentiles of whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. So now he goes and he starts talking about the Gentiles. So what does the rebuilding of the tabernacle and it being in ruins have to do with the Gentiles? Is James giving prophecy by, by quoting Old Testament, saying, all right, the Jews have to go and be dispersed among the nations and then come back. In, in order. And so now is the time for God going to the Gentiles. So that's what we call the church age. We call the church age the time of grace or the time of the church. And the people getting saved the most during the church age is Gentiles. Many Jews today don't want to be saved. And so they will get the message of salvation for them in the tribulation. But today the message of salvation is through the message of Paul. And what did Paul say? You trust the blood to be saved. So now verse 17, the residue of man might seek after the Lord and all the nation, Gentiles of whom my name is called, saith the Lord who doeth all these things. So there are passages in the Old Testament that speak about Israel and then there are passages in the Old Testament that speak about the Gentiles and how God would eventually save the Gentiles. Let's look at Isaiah 62, 6. What he says in verse, 13, verse 17 kind of sounds like Isaiah 62, 6. I looked and looked and looked and looked to try to find to see if verse 17 is a quote of an Old Testament passage. And the only thing that is similar to that is Isaiah 62, 6. And look what it says in Isaiah chapter 62, oh, excuse me, 2, not 6. Isaiah 62, 2. And the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness, and all kings thy glory, and thou shalt be called by a new name which the mouth of the Lord shall name. And then he continues on there. So here's a passage in the Old Testament where God says the Gentiles will see the Lord and will call upon him. So could it be that what, what James is saying is, I think Jesus is coming back soon. And if you remember, the temple had re been rebuilt already before Jesus. So was that him saying, and so that rebuilt temple while we are in the last days. And so he's thinking that in his time, they're in the last days. Maybe that's what he's thinking. Okay, so anyway, in the Old Testament there are many passages about the Gentiles eventually getting saved. And they're kind of, you know, cryptic and hidden in there. And uh, a lot of Jews today don't want to believe that God's talking about that he would send salvation to the Gentiles, but he would. Let me give you a couple of quick uh, examples of this. Isaiah 11.10 
And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. So here's the Gentiles. Paul quotes this in Romans 15, 12. So here's a, a time that's glorious for the Gentiles because they seek after the true God. They seek after Jesus, who we know now is the Messiah, Jesus. Isaiah 42, 6 and 7. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness, and will hold thine hand, and will keep thee, and give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles, to open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison of them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. So God prophesied in the Old Testament that he's going to send a light to the Gentiles. Paul calls the gospel that he preaches the light, the glorious light of the gospel. And people that don't have the gospel, they're blinded to the gospel. Isaiah 49, 22, quickly. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will lift up mine hand to the Gentiles, and will set up my standard to the people, and they shall bring thy sons in their arms, and thy daughters shall be carried unto their souls. So there will be a time when God takes something to the Gentiles. He takes the light to the Gentiles. So I believe that's the church age, and that is what he did. Uh, Isaiah 60, verse 3, And the Gentiles come to thy light, and the kings to the brightness of thy rising. Now that can be applied to the church age, but also it, it could possibly be applied as well to the Millennial Kingdom. There will be some Gentiles in the Millennial Kingdom as well. So these Jews are reading their Old Testament. That's plain because they're quoting it left and right here in the book of Acts. And they're, they're going to some passages that just leave you scratch your hand going, okay, what does that mean? <laughs> How does that apply to what he's talking about? As we saw in verse 16. So back to Acts chapter 15 and verse 17. That the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. So now they recognize, James and the other apostles are recognizing, Gentiles can get saved, Gentiles can get saved. And how God's saving the Gentiles is the same way that we Jews are getting saved from here on out. It's all by this, what Paul's message in Acts chapter 13 is, that there was forgiveness of sins is through the blood atonement of Christ, and it's based upon when we believe. And when we believe in the blood of Christ, then we're saved. But we can't think that we have to do the law too. We have to understand it's no longer the law. It's by faith and not by works that we're saved. So we continue there in verse 18. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Yeah, yeah, amen. God knows everything. God knew from the beginning of the world that the Jews would reject him, so he knew he would take the gospel to the Gentiles. But he still gave them the opportunity to accept him, and the kingdom could have been then, but he knew they wouldn't. So God knew everything before he did it. Now verse 19, wherefore my sentence is, so James is the one in charge, and so he gives sentence after hearing both sides. And he says, wherefore my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. Verse 20, but that we write unto them that they should, and he gives four things that they should do. Alright, here's the four things that he tells the Gentiles. Notice, these would be commandments for a Christian in the New Testament. The first was abstain from pollution of idols. Okay, so you don't you don't worship idols nor have anything to do with the things that idols have to do with. Well, in that day and age when the Roman Empire ruled everything, there were idols everywhere. So basically it's you know abstain from the world, you know, don't be worldly. Abstain from fornication. Don't fornicate. Yet in the ancient time, the ancient world, well, that's all they did. They ran around and fornicated. Abstain from things strangled. All right, strangled. Why? Because you're not supposed to drink blood, and that's the last one. Abstain from blood. Don't eat blood. So eating of blood, okay? That was something that God forbid under the Old Testament law, but also before the law, he told them not to do that. And now we see after the law. So this is something God does not want men to do in any dispensation. Drink blood. There's something about drinking blood that makes God really mad. The Bible says the life of the flesh is in the blood. Uh, I'm not going to get into the fallen angels here. We've talked about that before. And The fallen angels were angels that chose to fall. And in Genesis 6, they mated with the daughters of, of, of men. How does an angel fall? Well, some people theorize, theorized that they drink the blood. So if an angel were to drink the blood of man, then somehow that would make him mortal. I don't know. But that would sure explain where these you know, old stories of vampires come from, uh, based in history, based in something that really did happen, possibly. So I'm not saying dogmatically that, that <laughs> fallen angels drink blood, but I'm saying, well, wouldn't that be something? Maybe that's why God's so adamant against drinking of blood, because that was the sin of the fallen angels. I don't know. So 
the four things that they weren't to do, verse 20, but that you write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. And then he says the very same thing again in verse 29, that they abstain from meats offered to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication, from which if you keep yourselves, you shall do well, fare you well. All right, so that's how this whole thing ends. The answer to the question of do we have to be circumcised to get saved and do we have to keep the law was no. You do not have to be circumcised and you do not keep the law to get saved. You're saved by grace through faith. And then James says, now if you're a Gentile, here's the four things that I want you to do. Now he doesn't say you get saved if you do these four things. He says, now here's some commands that, that we recommend that you do if you're a saved Gentile. Don't eat things sacrificed to blood. Don't drink blood. Don't fornicate. And don't go after uh, things that are that are strangled. All right. So that's that's how this ended. So the answer is you're not saved by works. Thank God for that. And then in verse twenty one, for Moses full time hath in every city them that preach him, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. So Moses is preached in the synagogues, and he's saying that there's synagogues in every city. So there were Jews that lived in just about every city. So anywhere you went, you could go into a Jewish synagogue and hear the law. And the law of Moses was a great law, a moral law. And many of the countries understood the moral law, and, and like the Hammurabi's code sounds a lot like parts of the law. So to use the law of Moses as a moral code is great. But you don't keep the law of Moses by sacrifices and by thinking that if you keep it, it will save you. Realize that you're saved by faith. That's what he's saying. Now, verse 22, Then pleased that the apostles and elders and the whole church to send chosen men of their own company, Antioch, with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, surnamed Barsabbas, and Silas, chief men among the brethren. Now, Silas is mentioned often with Paul, but here's a man named Judas. Now, Judas here, surnamed Barsabbas, I believe he was called. What they, how they say it? Judas, surnamed Barsabbas. Barsabbas. That's Jude in the book of Jude. The book of Jude is toward the end of our Bible. This is Jude. Now what I want to do is I want to read you the book of Jude. But before I do, let me go a little bit down farther because he's mentioned here again. Um, it says here in verse 27, We have sent therefore Judas and Silas who shall also tell you the same things by mouth. Okay, Let's go over to the book of Jude because this will tie this whole thing together. A lot of people have asked, Brother Breaker, who is Jude in the Bible? <laughs> what is Jude? Why is it where it is in the Bible? What? And, and I go, well, if you rightly divide the, the word of truth, you look at all the books in the Bible and all the men that wrote the books, and you try to look at the book of Acts, because that's chronological of, of the early church, and you try to fit where they fit on the timeline, and you say, okay, there's a guy named Jude. All right, let's read Jude. Jude's epistle was an epistle by Jude. Look what it says. Jude. Now, it says in my Bible that Jude was written in 66 AD. That would be way later than the things that are taking place here. And it's possible. But look at what Jude says. I'm just going to read the whole book of Jude as quickly as possible because what we see here is what we just saw in Acts chapter 15. Acts 15, men were coming saying, you have to do this to be saved. And what were they doing? They were saying something wasn't true. And so they were trying to twist what salvation really was. Look how Jude looked at these men. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God and the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Okay. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. The first thing Jude says was, all right, Defend the issue of salvation, and remember, it's about faith. He's not saying, we're all saved by circumcision and following the law. He's saying, it's faith. That's what they all got together and settled on in Acts chapter 15, is, hey, it's salvation by faith. So Jude is writing to whoever he's writing, and he's saying, listen, it's all faith. Why? Why is it important to earnestly contend for this, for the preaching of Paul? Because verse 4, For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our Lord, of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace! 
Peter says in Acts 15, but we believe that by grace we shall be saved even as they. It all ties together. The Bible all ties together. You can rightly divide it if you read it. So Jude was there in Acts 15. He heard the arguments. And he said, no, it's not the works. It's not the law that saves us. It's faith. And our salvation is by faith. And these people that come in and say you have to keep the law, well, they're turning against grace. And they're wrong. Verse 5, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterwards destroyed them that believed not. Now, a lot of people say, this means you can lose your salvation. What's the context? The context is, and we read, there were some Pharisees who believed. But they said, but you have to keep the law. They would have maybe believed that Jesus was the Messiah, but they would not trust the blood of Christ. They would not believe that Jesus was the only way to heaven. They would not trust in Christ alone. They wanted to make it into faith and works. So they weren't saved. Then it says in verse 6, The angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, and reserved in everlasting chains under darkness into the judgment of the great day, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication, and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise domination, uh, dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the body, uh, with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. Does not bring a, against him a railing accusation. Said the Lord rebukely. But these speak evil of those things which they know not. But what they know naturally as brute beasts in those in those things they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them, for they have run the way of Cain and ran greatly after the error of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Cory. These are spots in your feast of charity when they. Feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about with winds, trees whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars, stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. <sighs> on and on and on here, he talks about these bad people who tried to come into the church and corrupt people. Who could he be speaking about? Sounds like to me, if he was there in Acts chapter 15, He's talking about that crowd, the Pharisees, that came in and said, No, it's the law. You've got to keep the law to be saved. They were trying to get people to come back to them because they were the priests and make money off of them. You see, religion makes money. That's why the Catholic Church wants priests. So you pay the priest for this, that, or the other thing. It's about money. No, it's not about money. According to Paul and the true gospel, it's about faith. And once you're saved, thank God you're saved. And he continues there in verse 15, talking about them. And I love how he says, They are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners... He says the word ungodly several times. It's kind of funny. Verse 16, These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lust, and their mouth speaking great smelling... Swelling... Smelling... <laughs> swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. But, beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lust. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the Spirit. Reminds me of what Paul says in the book of Galatians. Did you get the Spirit by the keeping of the law or by faith? If you're thinking you're saved by the law, you don't get the Holy Spirit. The only way to get the Holy Spirit, according to Acts 15, is by faith. So here you have some lost religious people who are trying to keep the law. Why are they lost? Because they're thinking they're saved by their works. And they're lost. And Jude warns us of such people. He says they're not even saved. They don't even have the Spirit, verse 19. Verse 20, But ye, beloved brethren, building up yourselves in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ under eternal life, and if some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of, our glory, of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Notice what Jude says. Our Savior is Jesus. We are not our own Savior. Those who are under the law think they can save themselves because of what they did. But when you understand salvation is by faith, then you say, I have a Savior, and He saved me. So I see Jude, when he's writing that book, I see who he's writing against, and he's so angry at these people. Because why? All right, let's continue reading back here in Acts chapter 15, and look at verse 21. Acts 15, 21, For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls. 
When we get saved, what's saved? Our soul. So it's all a salvation issue. How is our soul saved today? By faith. Faith in the blood, Romans 3.25. If someone comes over here and says, nope, you got to be circumcised and keep the law, and that's how you get saved, they're subverting your soul. They're damning your soul to hell with a curse. The Bible says curse is everyone that continues not. It, it, it's, it's, it's not right to preach that the law saves or works saves. It's wrong. So many of these people, even though some might have believed, there in verse 5, some of the Pharisees believed. What did they believe? They either believed with the head but not with the heart, or they just believed that Jesus might have been the Messiah, but they didn't trust in what he did to save them. They were still thinking, no, i got to keep the law. i got to keep the law. i got to keep the law. Such people are lost. Now, think about what we just read in Acts chapter 15. In Acts chapter 15, two sides, two warring factions, if you will, came together. And one says, you're saved by the works of the law, and the other says, you're not. You're saved by faith. They all have their little debate. Then James steps up and says, all right, you're right. Paul, we agree with you. We're saved by faith, and we're saved by grace, and it's not the works of the law. What do you think that other side did? They lost. They lost the argument. So what did they do? They got angry. They got mad. They got upset. Now they turned into to, to evil, wicked, ungodly men that were just fighting and attacking it, kind of like that guy that called me on the phone the other day. I don't know if I told you on this one or last week, but I got a phone call from a guy who claimed to be a Bible believer. And he um, tried to show me where he said I was wrong in the Bible. And I said, well, go ahead and show me. He tried to tell me, you're wrong here, you're wrong here. And I said, no, sir. The Bible says that. And I tried to show him. And as a matter of fact, it was all about this very topic that we're talking about today, this message here and the message of the blood. And the guy did not want to hear about the blood atonement and, and the importance of understanding the right division in the Bible. And he got so upset, he said, fine. I'm just going to go make my own YouTube video and attack your ministry. And it's my goal in life to destroy you and your ministry on YouTube. And I was like, so think about this for a moment. When there's an argument, usually the guy that loses an argument gets really bitter and upset. And this is what happened. So this makes the whole Bible so easy to understand. As you read the book of Acts and you see... When this happens, now I understand the book of Galatians. Paul is writing uh, to these people that joined that side. It says, what are you doing? You're saved by faith, not by the works of the law. Did you receive the Spirit by the law? No, you've fallen from grace. You're not coming to the true message of salvation for today. You're going back under an old dispensation. You're wrong. And it helps you to understand what was taking place. So what you had is the early church was all on the same page in the early book of Acts, believing who Jesus was. But when Jesus revealed unto Paul, now this is the message I want preached, it's what I did that saves you. Many of these people said we can't accept that. We still think we've got to keep the law. And Paul says, well, you're wrong. And here in Acts chapter 15, we find the early apostles jump on the side of Paul and say, yeah, they're wrong. And Jude was against them. Now James, well, I think James is written really early, so kind of hard to look at James. But James, when he starts out, he says he's writing to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. So, it's interesting. Um, Acts chapter 15, where did we stop here? So, then it, verse 22, Then it pleased the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, surnamed Barsabbas, and Silas. Judas would be Jude. We read the whole epistle of Jude. It looks like he's writing against those people that are trying to get people under the law chief men among the brethren. Verse 23, And they wrote letters by them after this manner, the apostles and elders and brethren send greeting unto the brethren which are of, Gen of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. Verse 24, For as much as we have heard that certain went out from us, certain which went out from us, have troubled you with words. Those would be the ones that Jude is writing against. Those are trying to trouble those that are over here. And even to this day, we have the same thing. I cannot tell you how many emails I get from people. Brother Breaker, you're so wrong. You don't know what you're talking about. you got to keep the law to get to heaven. Why, it's your works. What are you doing with your false gospel that salvation's only by faith? What a liar. What a hypocrite you are, Robert. And it's like, no, I'm on the side of Paul and the early apostles. You're that guy. I know you. You're that guy. 
that doesn't understand the gospel, that is angry and hateful and ungodly and is trying to subvert the souls of people by trying to tell them it's the law that saves. Oh, oh, I recognize you Why you were around 2,000 years ago and the apostle said to you and said no thanks. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? No, it's not the law. No, it's not the works. It's faith alone that saves us. So, wow. Well, the church hasn't changed much to still, to still see the two groups. Both sides say they're Christians. But those that are believing in the blood atonement of Christ are the only ones that are saved. Those that say they're Christians but say you have to do works or keep the law, they're the lost people. Now, were they lost back then? I don't know. But it sounds like it. Uh, they were called ungodly by Jude. So they might have believed to an extent that Jesus was God, but they would not give up their own self-righteousness and trust alone in what Jesus did. They kept thinking, but i got to do something to either get it or to keep it. And that's not salvation. According to Paul in Acts chapter 15, all the apostles coming together and accepting this message, we are saved by grace, not by works. I hope you get that. Your soul, your soul depends on it. I hope you're saved. So we continue here in verse uh, 24 where it talks about they were being troubled, subverting your souls, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law to whom we gave no such commandment. Verse 25, it seemed good with one uh, unto us being assembled with one accord to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. They didn't hazard their lives for the law of Moses. They hazarded their life for the message of salvation by faith in the blood of Christ. Verse 27, We have sent therefore Judas and Silas, who shall also tell you the same things by mouth. Well, this is Jude. So Jude went as well. Verse 28, For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than those these necessary things. Now wait a minute. To who? To the Holy Ghost. Who had the Holy Spirit out of those two groups? Those that believed. Those that were under the law. Well, they didn't have the Holy Spirit. Paul's writing into them in the book of Galatians. He says, did you receive the Spirit of the Spirit by the keeping of the law? No, but by the hearing of faith. You don't get saved by the law. You don't even get the Holy Spirit. The law teaches if you do this, then you might get this. There, But it's works, and works don't save us. The only way to be saved and to get the Holy Spirit is by faith. Now verse 29, or excuse me, verse 28. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than you than these necessary things. And then he repeats in verse 29 what he said to them in verse uh, 20. That you abstain from meats offered to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication and from which if ye keep yourselves ye shall do well. Doesn't say ye shall be saved. See, these aren't commandments. If you do these commandments, you get saved. No. Now that you're saved, do these and you'll do well. You'll serve God. Um, don't walk in the flesh. It says, Fare you well. Now, verse 30. So when they were dismissed, they came to Antioch, and when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the epistle. All right? So there was an epistle there. Part of what we're reading is an epistle. It was written by the early council, or the early uh, assembly of the early church. Now, verse 31. Which, when they had read, they rejoiced for the consolation. Yeah, I would rejoice if I was a Gentile at that time. I'd be like, shoo, I don't have to drop my britches and have somebody cut me up. <laughs> I'm saved by faith alone, not by doing something. Thank God for that. Now verse 32, And Judas, which is Jude, and Silas, being prophets also for themselves, exhorted the brethren with many words and confirmed them. All right, what did they do? They confirmed what? They confirmed them in the faith to see what they were believing in. They didn't go and say, well, what are your works? Show me what you're doing. I want to see if you're doing the law or not. They went and said, okay, I want to earnestly contend for the faith. Are you saved? Tell me your testimony. What are you believing in to get you to heaven? Well, I'm trusting in the blood. Okay, you're my brother in Christ. See, it's not the works we do that prove we're saved. It's whether we believe or not from the heart in the atonement of Christ. Verse 33, and after they had tarried their space, they were let go in peace from the brethren unto the apostles. Now, verse uh, 34, notwithstanding, it pleased Silas to abide there still. Paul also and Barnabas continued in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. And some days after, Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord, and see how they do. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought not good to take him with them, who departed from them from Pamphylia, and went not with them to the work. Okay, we're almost done here. I'll have to go a little bit long today. 
And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from the other. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed into Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas and departed being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. And what you have here, I guess, is the first church split. <laughs> used to be Paul and Barnabas. But now it's Paul and Silas and Barnabas and John Mark. And so now you have two going out instead of just two guys together, which would be one uh, um, uh, caravan. Now you've got two. So sometimes that's a good thing. Uh, this close this clearly shows me that Christians are not always going to get along. All right, The beginning of the chapter, it's a salvation issue. And they had to separate themselves from those that, fall, that preached a false gospel. They didn't have salvation right. But clearly Paul and Barnabas are saved, but they just didn't get along. So they separated. As a Christian, there are some people that I don't like, that I separate myself from. But they're just as saved as they can be. And I love them in the Lord. I just, I just don't want to be around them, or they don't want to be around me. Maybe I want to be around them, but they don't want me. But then there are those that I look at and I say, clearly, they're not saved. I don't want anything to do with them. So be careful. It's very easy to attack someone and put someone down and name call and, and, and lie about other people and... And that's not what God called us to do. We're supposed to do the work of the Lord. So we see Paul and Barnabas, they're separating. But guess what? They still love each other in the Lord. Nowhere in the book of Acts does Paul say, Well, that reprobate, moron, idiot, vile piece of crap, uh, Barnabas. <laughs> Nowhere in the Bible do we see Barnabas say, That pug-nosed, cross-eyed snake, well, I hate... There were no name-calling, there were no... Incident. There were, okay, you go serve the Lord over here, I'll go serve the Lord over here. Love you in the Lord, we just can't get along. So if you're a Christian and you don't get along with other brothers in Christ, the last thing you need to do is attack and put down and ridicule and name call. How about we just agree to disagree and say, well, brother, you go do your thing, I'll go do mine. And so that's what happened here is Paul uh, left and uh, he chose Silas and Barnabas so, uh, told, uh, chose John Mark. Now who is John Mark? Acts chapter 12, verse 25, he's been mentioned before. And in Acts 12, 25, in the first missionary journey, this guy, John Mark, went with Paul and Barnabas. And in Acts 12, 25, it says, And as John fulfilled his course, he said, I'm in 13, excuse me, 12, 25, And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry and took with them John, whose surname was Mark. So this is the Mark guy, John Mark. Now Acts 13, 13, look at this. Now when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. This is John Mark, because his name is John and Mark. John Mark. So he left. And Paul never forgot that. He says, I don't, I don't like this guy. Why did he leave? So in Acts chapter 15, we go through this huge chapter, and Paul says, no, I don't want to be around that guy. He quit on Jesus. And I think, and I wasn't there, but if I had been, I, I bet the discussion probably went like this. But Paul, Barnabas would say, he wants to try again. Paul would have said, well, he gave up, so he's just forget him. I don't want to go anywhere with a guy that gives up. But, but Paul, and, and for some reason or another, they, and so he says, well, I'm going to give him a second chance. So Barnabas took John Mark with him and went out and did the ministry. Paul went out with Silas. Now, did it end there? No, thank God. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 4. For some reason, the Apostle Paul had a change of heart about this guy named Mark, John Mark. And at the end of his ministry, Paul says, in 2 Timothy 4.11, Only Luke is with me. Take Mark. Now that would be John Mark. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. So I don't know why it took so long for Paul to forgive him and then say, come on over and fellowship with me. But Paul said, I will not have anything to do with that guy. Now sometimes we as Christians, we do that. We get in the flesh. There might be something that is different from another person, and we clash, and we don't get along. It's not sin to separate from them. It is sin to attack them and put them down, ridicule them, name call them, be bad and, and, and evil toward them. But sometimes they will come back. And sometimes we can apologize to them and say, Brother, you know, I'm sorry all these years I, I said these things about you. And it's, it's just, to me, it's a happy ending. It's wonderful when Christians that didn't get along before they come back together in fellowship. But sometimes one of them, or maybe both of them, have to overcome their pride. It's very easy to be prideful and think, well, I'm right and that guy's wrong. And the last thing we need to do is fight against one another. 
We need to we need to fight together as we earnestly contend for the faith. This guy that called me on the phone the other day claimed to be a believer in Christ, yelling, screaming at me, saying, "Oh well, I don't agree with you, and I think you're wrong. This is horrible that you would talk this way." Rah, 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 rah. And he hangs up the phone, and before he hangs up, he says, I'm going to make my own YouTube video, and I'm going to destroy you and your ministry. Where's, where's that in the Bible? The Bible says we're to edify one another. Edify means build up. Nowhere in the Bible do I, does I find a place where it says one Christian should devote his entire time and energy to destroying another Christian. The destroyer in the Bible is Satan. I don't know what was wrong with that fella. But uh, he's definitely in the flesh. I wish him the best. If he watches this video, I want you to know, man, I'm praying for you. And I'm praying that you get right with the Lord. I love you in the Lord. And I hope someday, maybe like Paul invited Mark to come back, hey, I invite you, mister. Give me a call back. Maybe we'll get along. Maybe we can put to rest your, your debate against me. Because I love you in the Lord. I just want you to know that. Well, that's about it. That's Acts 15. I hope it was a blessing. God bless you. We'll, we'll start in Acts 16 next time. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye.